Gregory, are you ready? Okay, uh, welcome back. We're going to uh, we're going to resume. I uh, just want to give you my tentative plan for the uh, rest of the day. We will be here until six thirty. No, uh, I hope to uh, break at four and, and not go past that. I I hope maybe get a little earlier, but I think we'll need the time to get to where we want to be. So uh, I think four is is good. Um, I just have a request from all of our Dorian fans um, watching online. Um, they were wondering if when we're referencing specific um, items, we could mention the page number. Um, so if that's not too much trouble. Okay, we'll try to remember to do I, that. Just passing it along. All right, we, we start with Jessica has a like Sure. Um, there was, I heard a few times mentioned before lunch that Ed indicates to issue, that it is going to issue a new NPRM for the borrower defense rule, and that was a bombshell in the legal aid world. Um, and we have many questions. I was wondering if someone in this room or someone wants to come in who could maybe answer just a couple of them, but I want to give you guys time to... If you have specific questions, I'll try to address them. If it's something I don't know, I will let you know. But um, yes, it is true. We are working on one now. Thank you. I guess, um, you know, from my perspective, the borrower defense issues are intimately related with a lot of the issues here because as we're all talking about protecting students and it's on the front end or the back end and what the, the after effects might look like are really important to think about what we need to do at the beginning. Um, so do you, you know, I'm particularly concerned about the timing of these two rules. Do you have a sense of which NPRM, for, I'm, I'm talking about the current session or the new borrower defense NPRM might come out first and which final rule might come out first? If I, if I were a betting person, which I'm typically not, I would say that the NPRM for borrower defense would come out first. Uh, obviously, there are other clearances that we need to do. And I, I don't want to distract from this effort by taking too much time to discuss that one, but I would anticipate that that one would be out much sooner. Sure. And just a blanket statement, I really appreciated your clarification about the teach outs. I, you know, I might start now that I know that everything in borrower defense seems to be back on the table. That's a little bit concerning. And I think that that might, you know, be a thing that I'm going to be raising a few times. I'll try not to beat that drum. But is there any thing else you could give us about that what that rule does or doesn't do versus the language that we've seen so we sort of know where we're heading because I think it is really important. I'd have to go back and, and really re-review and, and look at what has changed. I, I can't think of anything that would seem like a bombshell, uh, I guess, other than what I've already delivered today, which I didn't expect to be as much of a bombshell as it was. Uh, so surprise there. But um, I would just remind everybody that because it is a new NPRM, there will be another opportunity for public comment. And I think that I can say we reacted to the public comments that we received 
uh, on the first go round. So being mindful of the, co the comments that we've already received, that shaped very heavily uh, what we were putting out after that. And I think that people will be very pleased with uh, the newer NPRM compared with where we were on the first one. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that I, I felt we responded to what we received when I think the criticism we heard was that we weren't being responsive to that. I, I really feel that we were. Thank you very much. I genuinely appreciate that. And one final question, which is, do you have any similar announcements regarding gainful employment? I will just highlight that I was the negotiator for borrower defense and Mr. Greg Martin was the negotiator for that. So I'll have to leave that to him. Uh, no, we, we, we don't have any additional, uh, uh, any additional activity on gainful employment. Uh, as you know, we, we issued a, a notice of proposed rulemaking and um, we, are, uh, we evaluated the uh, comments as a result of that. We are in the, we are in the process of uh, preparing and getting cleared a, uh, a, a, final, a final rule. So right now, that's where we are. I, I w I'm not going to uh, uh, put myself at risk by giving any time, type of time frame as to when that might come out. Um, we, we, we still ex expect to issue that, but I, again, uh, um, <clears throat> having been with the department for nearly 30 years, I've learned never to give. Uh, it'll be by a certain time, spring, February, whatever. So I'm, I'm not going to do that, but we still are preparing the final rule as we speak. Thank, thank you guys very much. Our pleasure. Okay, we're going to uh, continue with a. Uh, uh, Dave and I were going over these myriad uh, items in 600, a couple of which we had we had uh, failed to account for on the on the schedule initially, and one of those is um, 600.20. So we're going to go to 600.20. I believe that is on page 20. Can someone correct me if I'm wrong? Right. It's on page 20. 600.20 in, in subpart B. This is the notice and application procedures for establishing, reestablishing, maintaining, and or expanding institutional eligibility and certification. And what most of these changes do, as you read through them, is uh, sort of a statement here that that obligates the secretary to ensure prompt action is taken with respect to applications. It, and I think this has to do with um, criticism that we have received in the past that. Applications for eligibility and um, other other types of applications uh, that need to, need approval by the department um, have taken uh, more time than perhaps they should have uh, to go through. So this is just sort of saying that we 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 hear you about that and that we are making efforts to uh, to make certain that that uh, that that's done in a more timely in a more timely way. And you can see, for instance, we do it there with initial application and. Uh, we do it with um, uh, uh, application, any application for, for changes. So basically that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, there is a more uh, in D notice and application. You'll see that we have uh, stricken the uh, stricken uh, the, the language reading that an institution that submits a notice in accordance with uh, with the uh, applicable paragraph of this of this section, is not required to obtain or uh, approval to offer the additional educational program unless the secretary alerts the institution at least 30 days prior to the first day of class that the program must be approved for Title IV HEA purposes. If the secretary alerts the institution that an additional program must be approved, the secretary will treat the, um, the notice provided about the additional program as an application for that program, so we have eliminated that. Um, just for the record, that's page 22. And that's on, yeah. correct, that's on page 22, under um, the same rule. Yeah, just a tiny bit of context around these changes. These are, these are not substantive changes, really. Um, it, the, the last one that Greg mentioned has at least some impact. The other ones are just requiring the secretary to take prompt action and recognizing that it's one of our responsibilities to, to, to deal with these kinds of applications as soon as possible. Uh, 600.20 um, involves cases where the institution uh, it has to apply and receive approval from the secretary um, regarding program eligibility. Uh, we're going to go to another section in just a second in which it's uh, just reporting, not approval. 
but this is we're recognizing in this section that we need to take very prompt action to make sure that institutions that have to seek approval get that approval or get a denial if the if the secretary is going to do that as quickly as possible. The the um, thing that we struck is um, something that basically is uh, intended to do the same thing. It's to say that if the secretary doesn't get back to you quickly, um, then you're then you don't you're not subject to approval. But the expectation that we're trying to create in the department is that we will get this handled quickly. So we don't believe that the um, that the exemption is necessary. So again, um, this is just us trying to police ourselves and make ourselves work faster for you guys, the institutions, and for students. Jillian. I just wanted to say it's great. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, okay. please be prompt. We we like prompt. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica. Um, I'm not sure if I'm reading the language struck and be right, but it seems like the department is maybe taking away its own authority to stop an application from being automatically approved if there's no action. And it, I'm not, I, I could be reading it wrong, but I just would want to preserve any rights the department has to stop the approval of a program and make it's, sure that that's right. It's the opposite. Um, what, what it says is that if, if we had left it in, um, what it says is that the institution is not required to obtain approval if the secretary doesn't notify them that they need to get the approval. We're removing that, so it means that they still need our approval in that case. Yeah, I guess I was worried about how the second half interacts, but you understand my broader concern. It, it, it's obligating us to, to get, get to get back to the institution quickly, right? Um, yeah. So basically, we you know we do this in practice already, um, and it's part of part of the secretary's role to notify an institution quickly if it becomes aware that something that they are offering is either ineligible or requires our approval. Um, so we didn't feel that this was something that was necessary for us to do or to have in our, our regulations, and it's an attempt to simplify. We can come back to it if you want to look at it further. Um, but uh, I did want to. We, we wanted to get through this quickly. I wanted to mention, um, as we're going on, since I don't see any other cards, that uh, there are a couple of changes in 600.21. So we can scroll down to that, and I'll get get you a page number quickly. Um, hold on a sec. 24. You guys are faster than I am because I'm on a computer. Um, so, page 24. The requirements under 600.21 are requirements where an institution has to report to the secretary certain certain things, but is not necessarily required to receive approval by the secretary before offering something. So we've added a couple of reporting requirements. Generally, these requirements are um, must be must be met. The school has to tell us this stuff. Uh, no later than 10 days after the change occurs. So it's not a thing where we're approving. It's something where they, you, you, the school makes the change, and then you let us know what, what you've done. Uh, and we require uh, all of these things again within 10 days of the change. And these are two things that we're going to talk about later, but I just wanted to point your attention to them now. We're asking that they report the addition of a direct assessment program uh, when they add one, and we're asking that they report um, the establishment of a written arrangement that exceeds 25% uh, of a program. So things to keep in mind as we talk about those subjects later on. Jillian. Thanks. Um, regarding the direct assessment program, uh -huh. so um, I think what I understood that I read later in here is if it's a subsequent program that looks substantively like the one that's already been approved, then we don't have to get approval. So does there need to be clarification on here that if it's a first direct assessment program or a program that looks different than what's already been approved, it needs approval, or you feel like that's handled somewhere we else? So the way that we've written it, if you think it needs to be clarified, that's fine. What, what, what we intended was that if we approve it, you meet this, you automatically meet this reporting requirement, um, and we only require approval of, of, the fir of essentially the first one, uh, unless there's some substantial differences that we've outlined. Um, in those cases, we, yes, we, you will have to get approval. For all other direct assessment programs, only the 621 requirement for reporting re applies. Maybe I'll just... Um sort of check myself against this once we get to when you the get to it assessment. I just wanted yeah, to yeah. bring your attention to yep. it so that we didn't forget about it down the road yep thanks okay I'd like to move to um, 600.52 if you would go there and I believe that is found on page 31 Let's give you a moment to get there <clears throat> 
We're looking at definitions that are applicable to the eligibility of foreign institutions to participate in the uh, um, well, direct loan program, says FFEL there, but of course that's direct loan now. <laughs> Couple we, might, of, we might want to change that. We might want to, yeah. Maybe do we have everybody's approval to uh, to maybe we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna take maybe, that back. We're going to take that back with us and maybe change that. Right. So those of us who've been around a long time, sometimes you just it's just automatic, right? I, in fact, I still say things like certify alone, and it's, I, I can't get it out of my head. Uh, it's just because it's too I'm I'm too old. But I, even though I know the proper terms originate, um, so we're looking at 52, and us these are definitions that again apply to foreign institutions, and I want to point out here, and I, th I think it's important to make a distinction because a lot of people get this confused, that we're not talking about study abroad here. We're talking about foreign institutions. The, a, a foreign institution can only participate in the direct loan program. It's the only program they're eligible to participate in. So we're not talking about uh, study abroad, neither are we talking about students who are attending the foreign locations of American institutions. These are truly eligible foreign institutions. You know, we're not going to name names, so I won't give an example. Um, if we go over to uh, page 32, you'll see that uh, we're providing definitions, and one of those definitions is of a foreign institution. Um, a, a little bit of background. Currently, uh, students who are attending a foreign institution uh, are, on, are not allowed to have any portion of their education offered in the United States. None. The only exception is for a a PhD program where it's necessary for the student to come back to the United States to do research that's applicable to the PhD program and then for only one year, for a limitation of only one year. So if we're talking about undergraduate students, which is the majority of students involved in this, uh, they couldn't come back to the United States at all. The, ori the original intent of this was that we're talking about um, students who have, who have elected to enroll in a foreign institution, for, presumably for that experience. If I've enrolled in said foreign institution, I'm there because I want to go to school there, and the expectation is that I will be going to school there. It's one of the reasons why there is a prohibition, statutory prohibition on distance for those uh, programs. But there is a regulatory prohibition on them spending any time in the United States, and I th we've determined, and, I, and I, th I think this is an excellent um, change, that that perhaps saying that there's a 100% block on the students coming back to the United States to take coursework for any purpose is, is perhaps a little extreme and that there are some, there are some reasonable um, situations that you can envision where it would be appropriate for the student to come back to the United States. So let's just, before we can take questions, let's just look at what those, what we would be allowing here. Um, uh, so, we say, you know, the, the prohibitions there has no written arrangements uh, with, within the meaning of 668.5 with institutions or organizations located in the United States for enrolling in it for, at the foreign institution to take more than 25% of the courses required for the program uh, from institutions located in the United States. Does not permit students to complete more than 25% of the program by enrolling in an eligible institution in the United States. Um, so what we'd be essentially be allowing is, or would be, for these students who are enrolled as eligible students overseas to take 25% of the coursework that's pertinent to their program in the United States. That's really all we're doing here. Um, I, I think this is a change which would be very welcome uh, by, uh, by foreign institutions as well as the students who attend them. So having said that, we'll open the floor for discussion. Jody. Um, yeah, this is an issue that has come up for some of our institutions um, who have sought this change because um, some of our institutions have had um, agreements with foreign institutions for their student to do a study abroad program back in the U.S., for example, and it, there doesn't seem to be a very clear rationale for the past prohibition or the current prohibition, I guess we sh I should say, on um, not allowing students attending a foreign institution to, to take a study abroad year at a Title IV eligible institution back in the U.S. So we're in, we support that. I just want to point out that it is um, allowable, sort of building what Jody said, we do allow students who are enrolled in foreign institutions to study abroad at other, at other eligible foreign institutions, just not come back to the United States.
Okay, that's uh, that's great then. And I we hope we have support for that. Oh, I'm sorry. Sue. <laughs> we talked briefly at a break about this, about not necessarily the good foreign schools. I'm talking about some of the offshore medical schools. They have used that hook to try to have a master's program with a U.S.-based organization so that then they could have Title IV money. Does this prevent that from happening? I, I don't think this – this doesn't put any more restrictions on, on what is currently permissible uh, with respect to uh, – talking about Caribbean medical schools. Um, there are there are and you're familiar with those because you were there are rules there are rules that we have um, currently without going into great detail uh, that currently restrict uh, what what portion of a program can be offered by a foreign medical school um, anywhere else but at that school um, this this provision here is not meant to uh, affect that in any way it simply has to do with any foreign institution, I said there are other rules that are applicable to foreign medical schools that that would obviously um, impose more restrictions than, than, than what are here generally for, for a foreign institution. Right, and, and as, as Amory is pointing out, a lot of this has to do with, some of it has to do with, you know, students might want to come home for the summer and take coursework in the summer. Um, uh, we had schools. There also are a lot of. There are also a lot of. In, this was pointed out to me by some Italian schools. at the University, American University of Rome. They have a lot of students who are American students. They're U.S. citizens who attend that school because their parents have always lived overseas, and uh, these students have never been in the United States in their entire life. So, um, well, it could be argued. Well, then have their parents take them on vacation, but um, <laughs> but it does give an opportunity for students to perhaps come back and and have some, you know, a little bit of uh, of, of uh, Opportunity to study at a higher institution of higher education in the country of which they are, to, to, um, in which they have citizenship. So uh, there's that too. So I don't. I've looked a lot at foreign is, issues, mostly because I've had to, and um, I, I I don't see any. I don't personally see any downside to this at all. I... Go ahead, Sue. Um, just as a follow up to that. Um, one of the associations that I work closely with, the Association of Academic Health Care Centers, brought this to all of our um, attentions a few years ago because um, to complete the study, they were sending their offshore medical school students to a specific state, and they were paying um, to buy up those clinical rotation right. slots. Now, I would argue that that is part of their education. And so if they are buying up those slots for the third and fourth year, um, I'm wondering if this 25% will help us keep them from doing that and pushing U.S. medical school students out. As I said, it, this doesn't affect any this, – this doesn't further – I would say this puts no further constraints on anything that's already allowable out there. It's, it's simply it's, – this is a – this is allowing latitude where none currently exists. That that's what it's that's what it's doing. So it's not affecting any anything that without. I don't know that it's it's not within the scope of this committee to go into the to the rules attendant to foreign medical schools. But but we're not we're not the situation you're talking about there would not would not be affected either any way by what this rule has. Um, I Let me see if I, because I just said I'm not sure Greg answered your question. Did, did he? Could, well, I, because I take it your question, your concern is that this gives the foreign institutions more latitude or the students at the foreign institutions more latitude to come over here and take programs or clinical rotations as part of their program that may take those slots from students at um, United yeah, States. Right medical program yes yeah I just want to see what they have but it's, it's I think your concern is that the 25% would allow maybe those clinical rotations is that what your concern is 
it, it, okay, that, you can answer that, but I want to. It make doesn't. It, yeah, it, it would not. It, w it would not affect those. They would still be eligible. They they still are allowed to do the foreign medical school regulations permit. Um, uh, portion of the program, or I think clinical. Uh, David's looking it up, but but the what is allowed by the uh, by the uh, in the foreign school regulations would not be um, would not be constrained by this because currently, as this rules as this reads, there is no portion of. There's no portion of a program. Stu they students cannot come back to the United States for um, any portion of their education. There, are, there are different clinical rules in the in the foreign school. I mean, in the med foreign medical school regs, but this has no effect whatsoever on that. None whatsoever. Right. Marity. I think, and I'm out of my league a little bit of the, on this, but I know some of my um, colleagues from New York have had similar concerns, <laughs> and I think the concern is. Could the Department of Ed look into, would this open up an opportunity for foreign medical health sciences programs um, to further push down? We already see it happening in our medical schools where we can't get affiliation agreements with our local hospitals. It's alive and well in New York um, because the foreign medical schools have those affiliation agreements. So we have no place to put our med students. So I think the fear is, could this open it up more and I'm not an expert on it at all, but I, I think that's what I hear is there might be some other research. Okay, I see. I see. Through. Okay, I think I know what you're saying now. Would this, would this, um, open up more opportunity for students to come back from foreign med? I'll tell you what. What I'll give me an opportunity to look to go back and review the regulation and might be able to give you a little more a little more detail on that. So my understanding is that when you're doing these clinical rotations. That's not an entire course. It's a component of a course. So that's how they're able to say that they're coming here to do the clinical rotation piece because that's not a course. So this will not change that. There may be other places that could change that, but this does not do that. The idea behind this was a very student-friendly kind of piece to be able to say, let's say I'm going to study at a foreign institution but I want to come home for the summer and I want to go to my local community college and get a couple of classes out of the way at a less expensive price. I should be able to do that. It's my education. I'm able to transfer those back to the place that's giving me the degree. I want to have that opportunity as an American uh, who just happens to be here for the summer. Or perhaps I have a health issue and it puts me in this country while I have my health treatment, but I can go and take distance education courses here or something at my local uh, university. We want to make sure that we're allowing students to have more flexibility in their own education and not limit the students that are here uh, from getting an education while they are here. Denise, did you want to say something? No? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, then it's um, there's a separate regulation um, that deals with uh, affiliation agreements for clinical training for uh, foreign med medical, veterinary, and nursing schools. That's in 34 CFR 600.54. Um, it's a separate requirement that we were not planning to address in this rulemaking, and frankly, we can't address it if we don't have, um, you know, someone to, to, to speak to it um, from, from the foreign schools uh, at this time. We can look at it at some other time, um, but it's not something that I think we can add to this one. That I'll, I'll read what that says. It says, notwithstanding 34 CFR 668.5, which deals with written arrangements, an eligible foreign institution may not enter into a written arrangement under which an ineligible institution or organization provides any portion of one or more of the eligible pro programs. And then there's a sentence that says, for the purposes of this paragraph, written arrangements do not include affiliation agreements for the provision of clinical training for foreign medical vet veterinary or nursing schools. So that's that regulation exists. It's uh, it's not something that uh, that we had put on our agenda, um, and it wouldn't be affected by uh, what we're planning to change because this is an exemption. This exemption will be there whether we have zero percent or twenty five percent elsewhere. Go ahead, Greg. Okay. Any other? Can we just say, just because I feel like I should need to do this for my colleagues, that I really encourage the Department of Ed to go back and look at that and okay. realize the supply chain issues that are happening to our own students in those agreements. Okay. Noted. We will. 
Sue. And I'd like to share some information through that came through the Association of Academic Healthcare Centers. It specifically uh, references New York. And so some of our states have been putting legislation in place to keep them from moving in and doing the same thing. So do I forward that to David or Greg? Scott. Scott, thank you. Any other comments on, on the, the general provision? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and move on. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to move on then to uh, uh, written agreements, and that is in 668.5. So, different document now. So we're moving on to uh, general provisions, 668. Give you a chance to find that. Page and that's 14. On page 14. And don't worry about all the red lines before that. We promise we'll get back to it. Okay, um, as you probably, if you've reviewed this already, you should probably know the, uh, the um, revisions that we have uh, proposed here to 668.5 uh, do, do broaden to, to, to a fairly large extent the, um, the uh, parameters for establishing uh, written arrangements especially with respect to an in, uh, with ineligible entities, between eligible and ineligible entities. But I want to start with um, <clears throat> the changes here uh, there with respect to written arrangements between, uh, between eligible entities. Can I, can I pause quickly? Sorry, Greg, to, for inter interrupting. I just wanted to give some general context on the, on the rule so that we all understand what we're dealing with. Um, so outside of 668.5, the expectation is that an eligible institution provides the entire program uh, in which a student is enrolled in order for the student to receive Title IV aid. Um, there's no other provision uh, except you saw some some references to 668.5 in this in the Part 600 section. 668.5 deals with cases, and I want this is what I wanted to be clear about: cases in which there a, a written arrangement exists for a different entity other than the eligible institution providing the credential or degree um, to provide some uh, of the uh, coursework in the program, to provide some of the instruction and or coursework in the program. Uh, and the most important thing is un there are lots of occasions where it might you might be giving transfer credit. That's not what this is. There are lots of occasions where you might, a, a school might have uh, degree completion programs where a student comes in with an associate's and they're earning a bachelor's degree. That's also not what this is. This is an occasion where this, the eligible institution considers a student to be enrolled at the eligible institution while taking coursework provided by someone else. Uh, and that's what Greg is going to go through and explain uh, the, the changes to those provisions that we're making here. So if we, in looking at that, if we, <clears throat> if we look at what we have under written arrangements between the eligible institutions, uh, you'll note that generally speaking, uh, there are no uh, <clears throat> there are no restrictions on that as far as percentages are concerned. Um, you can see we describe what what that arrangement is, <clears throat> and you know uh, uh, another little bit of context. I found that eligible institutions, when they execute these agreements, generally refer to them as consortium consortium agreements, and, that, and that's what we're talking about here. You can have uh, and we'll say that um, agreements between an eligible and ineligible entity we've referred to in the handbook, and I think schools colloquially refer to them as contractual arrangements. So I do want to point out that both of those are under the aegis of written, they're, they're, both of those are written agreements. They're considered written agreements. You could argue, as Jeff Baker always did, that they're both contracts in a way, but we refer to them collectively as, as written agreements. So if you're thinking, well, what about my consortium agreement? That, that is what we're talking about here at least with respect to an eligible, to eligible entities. So you can see there are no restrictions uh, 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 there, um, except that the, uh, 
except that it meet the required the the uh, general requirements found in 668.8. I do direct you to A2, where it says if the written arrangement is between two or more eligible institutions that are owned or controlled by the same individual partnership or corporations, these are eligible. These are eligible institutions now that are controlled by the same individual partnership or corporation. The secretary considers the education program to be eligible if the programs offered by the if the educational program offered by the institution that grants the degree meets the requirements in 668.8. Go on to see what we've eliminated there. But used but currently we currently require uh, not only that it meet the requirements in 668.8, but that the institution that grants the degree or certificate uh, provides more than 50% of the educational program. So that currently where there is a uh, where there is an agreement between it would be a would be a consortium agreement between two eligible entities that are affiliated. Uh, the uh, institution providing the degree or granting the degree would have to provide more than 50 percent. That's been eliminated here. And uh, we can stop and take comments on that. David, um, <clears throat> just some clarification. So let's suppose that four institutions create a consortium. And each institution contributes the same number of online courses, so that uh, and then and then there's two ways for students to get the degree, or, or two ways that it could be set up. One is that students choose a home institution, and then my so so I assume that's okay. Yes, it is okay. And then my other question is, could those institutions offer a consortial degree? Or would that consortium now have to be somehow individually accredited? So you're talking about, of course, the simplest situation with a consortium is two institutions doing it. But you're talking about a little more sophisticated model here. We have numerous institutions. Um, we don't care if an inst if a student, and I'm going to have Dave like check my words here just to make sure we, because go down the limb here. Um, Dave and I do this to each other all the time. So if uh, no, there's no limitation on the number of degrees somebody can get. We do require that there be a home institution, and and we do require the student be matriculating in an institution. So if they're if they're a student at your institution, you must be providing that student a degree or or, or certificate <coughs> credential in order to give that student the, the 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 aid. If it turns out that in this consortia that you've put together, these consortia, that the student, it's the one agreement consortium, right? I, Forgetting my Latin, um, the uh, so that if if that's the case, and the students are going to get, a also get a degree at another institution as a result of this, we don't have any problem with that at all, and it wouldn't require any more than that there be a that there be a consortium or written written agreement that spells out the details of that. Now, my question is, could the institutions create a consortial degree? Um, uh, no, no. No, there's no consortial so, degree. The student's getting a degree could, at the institution here. She's you, matriculating. You could do you could do two things. I think you could have the student and be enrolled in one of those four institutions and grant the degree from that one, even though. And by the way, that's not possible under the current reg. That would only be possible in your four institution situation in with the the edit that we're making here, because in in the current rule, the institution that grants the degree or certificate has to offer 50 percent of the program. What I heard you say was. Each of the institutions is only offering 25%. So that is only possible after we make this regulatory change. But if you did that, assuming we make this change, then it, either the student would have to receive the degree from the one of the four eligible institutions, or you could be dual enrolled at all four, and all four could, 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 could confer the, de the degree simultaneously. Before you, and one more thing I just want to point out, because we get this problem a lot. When you start to set up these we we give you a lot of latitude with written written agreements, and we're proposing more here. Uh, but one of the things is I, I see that you always have to bear in mind is that the student must always be enrolled in an eligible program as a regular student. And we've seen this a lot with an eligible institution, a regular student at an eligible institution. And you'll see this with like respect to maybe a community college and a four-year college. They've got a joint degree program going on, but I was I had one where I was dealing with where the student was enrolled. If they, had been in, if they had been considered enrolled and matriculating at both institutions, it wouldn't have been a problem. But there was a period of time they were taking coursework at the four-year institution, not considered to be enrolled at the four-year institution at that time, and the coursework they were taking at that three and 400 level was not applicable back to the, the program they really were enrolled in, which was the 
associate degree program, and at that point, the student was an ineligible student. So you have to be careful when you construct these, maybe a little beyond the scope of what we started with here, but I think it's important to point that out. Uh, okay. I want to go back to what you just said, David. Uh, do you treat systems differently, even if the institutions in those systems are individually accredited? So, yeah, we, we don't treat them any differently. Um, we, there's a presumption that the student is enrolled uh, in at least one of the institutions within that, consort, uh, within that system, and that, in, that institution is the ineligible institution. Now, the student could bounce around within the system, and I know we know that happens often. Um, but again, technically, without this change, yeah, the, the, student, the student might not be eligible after the 50% point is reached. Jillian. I have a few questions. Um, I'm trying to understand. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm unclear where we left off on here. I'm sorry if I'm skipping ahead because it seems like some questions have been we're, skipping we're, ahead. We're still on A. We oh. Definitely, if you have questions about C, we should wait on those. We will yeah. get there, trust me. <laughs> uh, Jessica. Sure. What is another recognized education credential? So that's an excellent question. Um, it, it, there's no specific definition for, for that term, but it includes things like a diploma, a certificate, um, anything but a degree. Um, other things that um, the institution and its governance recognizes as a, as a full credential. What it doesn't include are things like um, certificates of completion, things that the institution considers not to be full credentials, um, but there's no hard definition about that. We kind of leave it up to the institution to determine where that line is drawn. Generally, an accrediting agency considers a recognized credential to be within the scope of what it accredits. Other things that aren't recognized credentials are outside the scope of what an accrediting agency accredits, and those are not Title IV eligible. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out whether what work the addition of that language here is doing in addition to degree and certificate in A1. And so, then uh, to, be, to be clear, that's just moving up what, what was in Romanet 1 right. before. So because we didn't need the Romanets anymore because we removed the second Romanet. The second Romanet was the, is the only real change mm -hmm. here. The first, well, the first one's rolled up into the – rolled up. It's just rolled up into what – into the it, It's eliminated because it would, be, it would be redundant to have it again. There's no more, longer 1 and 2. There's only one, so rather you wouldn't just put you wouldn't just put Roman at one there. You'd 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 move it up. You can blame the drafter, um, and I don't I have no idea who it was. But we we could have just deleted a few things and, and pull, pulled it back up without adding the diff additional language, and that made it may have made it simpler. But yeah, sorry, we just we just rolled it up. The big change is that we're allowing. Um, sorry, the big change is that we're allowing. Um, uh, the someone other than the degree granting institution to offer um, more than 50% of the program here. And, and we consider this to be a less, uh, a more minor change um, because we've got two eligible institutions that are otherwise accredited, authorized by their states, over which the department has authority, and they're just trading coursework essentially. Uh, and the student is still receiving a degree from one of those institutions at the end of the day. Uh, we noticed a lot of impediments. Um, I'll give one quick example and then we'll move on. But for example, a lot of times we have, we've had cases where schools have come to us and said, we want to have a, um, like a three-in-one program where a student takes three years at a, at, a, at a community college and then takes one year at, a post, at, a, at the baccalaureate level and completes the, the program at the baccalaureate level. And they want to have a consortium agreement, but they can't do that um, because the baccalaureate institution has to offer at least 50 percent under the current rules. And this allows them to have that partnership in which they are provide as long as the accrediting agency per allows it and the state allows it, they can provide that full degree. They can get the student can get the baccalaureate degree and they're otherwise eligible throughout the entire process. There's other ways to set up those arrangements, but this gives more flexibility. Moving. Okay. Um, with that, then uh, we will move down to the next change, which is under C. This involves written arrangements between an eligible institution and an il ineligible institution or organization. Uh, these would be commonly referred to as contractual uh, contractual arrangements. 
So you can see um, we did add, uh, uh, under these restrictions here, the ineligible institution or organization must be able to demonstrate experience in the, in the delivery and assessment of the program or portion of the program they will be contracted to deliver. So that's, that's an addition. If we move down to two, we'll see the, the, the uh, substance of the changes that are being proposed here. It might be instructive to look at what is currently the case so that you can see how that's proposed to change. So currently, if you look at what's the language that's stricken here, the educational program offered by the institution um, that grants the degree or certificate otherwise uh, satisfies what's in 668.8. And the ineligible institutional organization provides 25% or less of the educational program. So that's the current restriction, providing 25% or, or less. And um, the other, the, the other current, currently, it can be 25% or less, or it can be um, more than 25%, but less than 50% with the um, approval of the accreditor. So what we're, what we're, um, what we essentially be doing here is, um, if just reading through all this text, is, uh, is eliminating those, um, is eliminating those restrictions. So the, the way it's, the way it's listed here, there would be no uh, limitation on the amount of an eligible program that could be offered by an ineligible entity. Jillian. Um, I have several questions. Um, so I think to set up this conversation, I would be really interested in hearing um, the learnings that have come out of the EQIP experiment. Um, and I think this group probably would benefit from any data that could be shared with us. So you don't, okay. Sure. No, so I, can, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, and Julian's referring to an experiment that the, uh, that the department began carrying out, or at least initiated, um, back in 2015, uh, in which the uh, department granted this, the same basic type of flexibility that's described in these regulatory changes, but in a more controlled environment, uh, in which uh, an institution did have a partnership uh, with an otherwise ineligible entity. Um, to provide part of the program, to provide more than 50% of the program. Um, in the EQIP experiment, the department also required a form of, of quality assurance um, to, to a, a partnership to, to, to come into the picture. Um, the department is still um, performing that experiment, and we are um, getting data back from, from the institutions as well as collecting information about the, from the institutions and from the quality assurance entities and from their, uh, the institution's partners. Um, there's not a whole lot that I can tell you uh, at this point um, in terms of what, what we've learned from the program, except that um, there are a lot of occasions where um, the, the institutions at least had identified um, a ca cases where they were unable to serve uh, a group of students uh, and provide the skills that the students needed uh, for employment um, and that they were able to more adequately address that um, through their partnerships. Uh, what we also found was there was a lot, there was, it was very difficult for those institutions to actually set up the partnerships in the way that the EQUIP experiment had um, set up. Um, partly because of the three uh, entity partnership um, and partly because there was in some cases institutional resistance uh, to to the partnership um, there were sometimes practical barriers uh, and it led to several of the entrants um, no longer participating um, these regulatory changes are not it designed to recreate the equip experiment and they wouldn't necessarily Re exactly resemble uh, the equip experiment. Uh, we, this is a first attempt by the by the secretary to come up with a way that that we could do something like equip, um, but more broadly, uh, and and in a way that can actually be implemented by institutions uh, that will help students get the kinds of skills that they need uh, to enter the workforce uh, and become employed uh, more quickly. Thanks. Um... So my understanding of the purpose of experimental sites is to test something and then um, based on data sort of propose changes to language. So I guess I have concerns that we haven't learned 
much except that it's hard for schools to do um, from that experiment. So I would um, so I would just continue to use that lens as we think about what the right way is to support innovation. Um, I would advocate highly for a bare minimum, um, some something that looks like the quality assurance entity that was built into the Quip experiment because I think the way this is written to me um, sort of risks diluting what a definition of an institution of higher education is. I'm not sure if you put a shell around 100% of somebody else's program or some other organization's program that doesn't have experience in higher education. Um, I just have questions about sort of what that does to how we understand institutions of higher education. It seems like it could be a vesicle for fraud um, for an entity that doesn't have experience or expertise in administering um, programs. Um, and then a couple nitty things, I guess, which is one, um, so on page 16, where number five, where it talks about affirmative approval from um, an accreditor, is that the right place? I think I'm understanding that. Yes, from an accrediting agency, but then back in the accreditation section, Sorry to jump around. Um, on page 19, I'm reading this to say that if an institution hasn't had an issue for three years, they actually don't need to get um, a, approval ahead of time, and they just need to notify their accreditor. Um, so that's on page, tw I guess, 20 of the accreditation section. It starts on 19 where it says, among institutions that have not been placed on show cause, et cetera, the agency requires institutions to report within 30 days of making a change, and then on the next page it says entering into a written arrangement. So that seems... We'll, we'll take that back and look at it. I, I, I'm not sure if there's a conflict there, but it, it, it sounds like there's two slightly different things going on in terms of what we've required. So I think we, we need to look at that with the accreditation team a little bit. Um, I would also say, I know, I, sorry, I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, on page, sorry, back to the original language, then on page 15 where it talks about being able to demonstrate experience. I don't understand what that means. Maybe we should, could regulate the definition of demonstrating experience. I don't know. Um, so it would be helpful to understand sort of what the department's intention is with that language. Um, and those are probably all my feelings for now. I should provide, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think... As we as we talk about this, and I think we, there probably will be a, 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 a no dearth of opinions on where we ought to land with this, but um, the, the the intent here is to uh, recognize that, especially with respect to um, uh, perhaps certificate programs or where industry credentials are involved, to pr to provide some flexibility to schools with. Um, Providing an education that is that, that's useful in the workforce, um, especially with those programs that are intended to do just that, and that um, a lot of what might be necessary for an institution to um, to give students that education uh, may be being offered by these by these ineligible entities. And you might, as an example, I'll just pull one out: perhaps a labor union that um, that that uh, would have the bulk of experience necessary to teach someone to become a, a master in a trade. So to, to allow uh, institute to recognize that fact and to allow institutions uh, greater flexibility to uh, take advantage of, of, of those of, of those opportunities. So that that's where we're coming from uh, with proposing this. But again, we want to hear what you have to say about it. And uh, if you have uh, alternatives or you have uh, guardrails you feel will be put around it, we're, we're interested in hearing what those are. Okay. So, Leah. Um, these contractual arrangements are attractive, uh, especially for distance ed programs. Um, but with that, I think uh, extends the gatekeeping function to activities and entities that aren't subject to accreditation or state oversight. There's no rules about what are disclosed to students in the provision of these activities by these entities. And when you're getting into the range of 50%, um, perhaps without any scrutiny at all, I think that can raise a lot of questions about quality. Um, DEAC has had questions about that quality, and so for non-accredited, non-authorized entities that offer distance ed courses, um, they can come to us and we'll do a curriculum assessment and we'll, we'll look at the development behind it and its appropriateness for distance ed. Um, and then we'll, we'll certify them to be able to partner with our schools as they want. Um, not having something in place that looks at maybe some of the foundational aspects of is it appropriate to distance ed? You know, are the faculty qualified? 
are there aspects that authenticate the student, um, authenticate that they're doing the work? Um, I think that needs considered if we're going to this amount of training. And, and I don't know if we've reached a point through equip that we've we know how that's being handled and is it, is it be ha being handled well? Um, so again, I, I think that there are a lot of questions of monitoring and assuring quality. Um, and again, we're extending accreditors into space where we don't have a whole lot of control over what these non-accredited, non-state authorized entities do. A and I'll tell you, in groups that have tried to come to us for this review, we've turned some away because the curriculum isn't fully developed. The online system doesn't seem to work well. Uh, we've had our curriculum experts that come to us from either regionally or nationally accredited distance ed look at it as a third party and they've raised some questions to us as well. So just I think it's really, really important that we, we think carefully about expanding this into a 50% realm um, and how we have a process to assure that the quality of that learning experience. David Musser. I don't want to jump in line. I, I just want to clarify one thing about what you said. I, I definitely appreciate all of your comments there. Um, there is a requirement. It's not in 668.5. It is. It's in 668.43a, uh, uh, and I believe it's a12. And I brought it up on my phone, so I need to be sure. But yeah, um, there is a requirement that um, institutions disclose all written arrangements under 668.5, uh, including. And I'll get the language out to make sure that I'm getting it right. The portion of the educational program that the institution uh, is is. Uh, uh, giving away to another provider, uh, the name and location uh, of those organizations and the method of delivery as well as any additional costs. So there is there is a current and provision to disclose that information, um, but a lot of the other things that you've described um, certainly are things that, uh, that, that we want to consider and think about. Um, the, 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 we do want to be clear that institutions have to disclose these and they have to disclose them clearly when they exist. Um, it's not something that they uh, that they can just try to push push under the rug. David, um, I'm, let me give you two possible scenarios, and you tell me if these would be allowed or not, just so I get a better understanding. So, imagine a um, a financially challenged small liberal arts school that doesn't have money to hire a bunch of IT faculty, but is in a market where that's a hot area. So the school partners with a um, with a boot camp, an IT boot camp, and the IT boot camp says, you know, we could do a whole undergraduate degree for you. And the school says, great. Is that okay? Under this? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that our intention. We've heard a lot about about boot camps um, with respect to this. Um, our attention was our intention was not to. Uh, facilitate um, boot camps. Um, I, I do, and it, given your example, it, it were, if what you see here was, was in regulation, would it be possible for a, uh, in your case, you talked about a financially challenged um, small liberal arts college to say, well, we're going to um, essentially um, have this ineligible entity offer 100% of our program. Uh, nothing would prohibit that per se, uh, other, than the limit, other than the limitations that were referred to with the with whatever accreditation agency oversight exists within this in this rule. Okay. So they'd have to get the uh, affirmative approval by the accrediting agency, uh, essentially, in order to offer that in order to offer that program. But otherwise, uh, that given would, that, yes. that would be permitted. Okay. And um, so, similar scenario, uh, same school, but this time the school wants to bundle a bunch of Coursera courses to offer the degree. Okay. Um, this, the same thing would be true. It, it might be difficult for that school to, if, if, the, if the Coursera courses are being offered by various different institutions, technically that would be a written arrangement between all of those different institutions and they'd have to list every single one of the ones that were there and they'd have to get all of that approved by the accrediting agency affirmatively. But uh, yes, um, in general, it, all, that would be eligible as well under these, under these proposed rules. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, echo some of the concerns that have been stated around the table. I'm particularly unclear on 
why have all these Title IV requirements if we're then going to allow potentially 100% outsourcing? Um, that seems uh, nonsensical to me. And I'm also kind of wondering, given how, how um, specifically the definition of institution of higher education is um, written in the statute, where the statutory authority for this comes from, uh, because you're essentially allowing a non-Title IV institution to provide 100% of a program when it doesn't meet the statutory definition of an institution of higher education. I, I think, and, and let me and let me just say this with, with respect to the to to misgivings you may have or uh, parameters you think that we should we should adopt. Um, we're we're willing to hear what those are. So I mean, as you're thinking about uh, areas of this that, that that give you pause, uh, we would also ask that you uh, think of possible solutions to that or that we can put into the regulation because we uh, leadership really wants to is made it clear to me that they they really want to hear what you have to say with respect to that. Um, regarding the eligibility, I think. Even though the even though the coursework would be offered by uh, potentially. Uh, the way these rules are proposed by the ineligible entity, it would still be the eligible entity offering the offering the um, offering the uh, the um, the program and and the uh, and offering the uh, degree or certificate or other credential that uh, that would be uh, that the student would be receiving. <clears throat> but but I, under I understand what you're saying that yes, uh, under the, given these rules, would it be possible for that ineligible entity to, uh, to essentially provide the content for the whole program? Yes. Um, I just also wanted to add, I mean, I, I understand the um, desire to be innovative and to um, ad adapt to a changing educational landscape, but I think part of my concern about the statutory authority question is that I'm not sure that a regulation is the appropriate way to go about this, especially when Congress is actively considering reauthorizing the Higher Education Act, and this is really should, it's something that should be Congress's purview not a regulatory action. Okay, so basically your concerns are about the definition of higher education and I think that the department's perspective in putting this out there is that it can, it would be allowed on, because it does say provide and I think they're looking at providing to be broader than what the rest of you might have thought providing was, but I certainly will take your concerns back and take another look at the statutory piece of this. David um, Musser. Yeah, and so I know I'm, I'm interrupting a bunch of times and I apologize for that. But um, as we as we go on with this discussion, um, and we, we're very, we're sensitive to these concerns uh, that you guys are bringing up. Um, like I said, this is the first attempt. Um, and the attempt is designed to try to find ways to, to, to help students get access to the skills that they need to, to be employed in the workforce. And leadership at the department shares your concerns uh, about having, for example, degree programs that are 100% offered through um, by, by outside providers. And, and, you know, we thought about that. We thought, you know, this, this may be a way that, that maybe that can work. But if you guys think that some constraints are needed, so that, for example, uh, certificate programs or other kinds of recognized credentials that are shorter and that help students get into the workforce more quickly, if that's something that you think is more appropriate, we're, we're open to that too. We're open to, frankly, a lot of different ways of, of achieving that objective, of, of getting students um, the kind of training that is directly connected with the workforce, that, that is harder to achieve when there isn't that direct connection between students uh, and, and actual workforce kinds of programs. So if there are you know, ways that we could constrain this further, ways that we could you know, focus on the things that are most helpful as opposed to you know, leaving it broad, we're open to that. I would add to that if, if and I just, I pose this question uh, rhetorically, um, if 100 percent is, is a, happens to be, a, you know, you're saying, well, the entirety of this program being offered, uh, is there a um, is there another percentage you would uh, you would uh, consider or advocate for that you think would be provide more that would maybe provide more latitude than what's currently available, but uh, not be 100 percent? Oh, I ask that of everybody, not not just Jody. So, yeah. Gregory, just an observation. It's a lot of discussion on this 
And so there, evidently there's some feelings on this. <laughs> so maybe you would want to measure whether or not they feel that this needs a, re, a rethink. And perhaps they would be able to provide that, what they feel that they could live with. Because it seems like there's a lot of pushback. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we could take a temperature of, of, of whether or not uh, people how to word it, uh, the people have, um, I mean, is there general, I mean, a couple of questions I would, I would want to ask, and I don't know how we put this into that context, but, but is there general support for um, uh, more latitude than currently exists in regulation today, right? That's one thing I would ask. If so, uh, is there any, uh, what is the feeling, what is the general feeling about what we've proposed, which would, of course, allow 100%, um, and then if there's support for more latitude but not 100%, what would that be? Um, and, and maybe if we have some, you know, Tony's idea, if we have some ideas that come up about what that might be, we could take a temperature to see where you, where you stand on that. I don't know right now we've had any real, real proposals from the floor or any ideas that we could go on. We've got ours and what's currently in existence. So tell me what you, what you think. No, I just wanted, I, I think people, there's quite a few, I understand what you're saying, Tony, but I think there's quite a few people with their placards up and they probably yeah, some ideas. Yeah. should at least get their ideas out or their co ideas or concerns out on the floor so then everybody can hear them before we do that. I. Thank you. Uh, when I, you know, I don't know how many of you besides Jillian were in the meeting on Wednesday, I guess, but there is clearly public concern about this rulemaking, and it's not just me. There's lots of people out there. And I think that I would ask the department to seriously reconsider what is happening here. I think this is the exact sort of thing that is undermining a lot of people's, you know, Emory, you talked about how you really want to us to come in with good faith and you guys have been so wonderful in talking to us. And I really think that this is a proposal that really puts at risk um, people's belief in what the department is trying to do here. I think, you know, we we have a pilot program. We don't have much evidence from it. I, I haven't heard, you know, I'd like to hear from the department specifically what your goals are. And absent hearing that, it just really comes across, if this was not your intent, as a way to just like hyper deregulate the space and allow new actors to come in in a way that really wouldn't protect students. And I, I think, you know, maybe that's not what's happening, but I think this is open certainly to that interpretation. And I guess I'd ask you guys, you know, we can talk more. I want to hear everybody's thoughts, but to come back with a more specific reason for what it is you're trying to do, what you're do, trying to do so we can work together to figure out how to get there. Because I really think this is off the deep end. Thanks. I share a lot of the concerns that have already been articulated, um, so I don't want to necessarily repeat them, but I also see this as um, opening up sort of a, possibly a whole hole or vacuum in regulation and oversight um, that would open up um, more consumers to a really high risk of fraud and low quality programs through this mechanism. So I also would con uh, request that the department consider rethinking the approach here. Jillian and Marity. All right. Um, having been president at two universities that have were participants in the Equip program, uh, I'd encourage us not to use that as a basis for any findings because I don't think we realistically have any out of there um, due to a number of reasons and a little bit of a chicken in the egg of trying to figure out regulation as we go with that program. Um, so I, I think your point's well taken that that while maybe good intended to get an experimental program up, didn't come out perhaps, you know, wasn't thought through enough maybe at the front end to do that. Um, I find myself torn in this as well. And I, I think the idea of maybe looking at it separately from some of the micro-credentialing, the certificates and pieces like that versus the gestalt of the degree. And, and I share those feelings in a time where so many people are questioning the value of a degree that and again, I, I think I'm a little bit at the same place. And I feel like a broken record here that we're looking at, um, we're looking at accreditors at the same time as we're looking at 
loosening some of these other degrees, or um, not degrees, I should say, controls. And so if they all loosen together, what happens? And so we, I, I would encourage the same thing. I think this is one where we risk the entire process being perceived as bad because of just the public feeling around, you know, this one, as you guys know, has gotten more heat than a whole lot of your other changes. So um, my thought would be to go with, um, and it's not a new idea from the floor, because I think, David, you mentioned it, uh, to look maybe at a micro, um, like I said, break it up. So for us, maybe if certificate's easy to do, um, but by the time you get to a four-year degree or even a two-year degree, that the university or the, um, the approved institution stands for something there, more than we signed an agreement. Um, so are you suggesting like a credit limit on, uh, on when these kinds of, um, uh, how, how more than 50% could be, could be offered or a, a year limit or something like that? Yeah, probably a percentage. And I run into, the students I do with all the time run into this. So I, I want to open it up some. I just really want to make sure that at the end of the day, students who are holding that degree from an approved institution stand for something mm -hmm. and that we know what that is. All right, Jillian. Uh, so Mary D said sort of what I was going to say too was just um, that I think we need to remember the work that's happening in the accreditation um, proposed changes where I think as it's proposed now you just have to an accrediting agency just has to accredit one institution um, so I think there's a lot of moving pieces here to your point and you know I think there's concern about sort of how all these changes at the same time really can risk um, the whole infrastructure my question to the department and I don't know Leah if you can it's not fair that I put you on the spot so much to be like the one accreditor voice here but I would be interested also to know um, any data around how many institutions already are at the 50% point where they've had to request approval from their accreditor in the department um, for written agreements um, with other entities um. Unfortunately, uh, the department doesn't collect specific data. Uh, we collect data on institutions that have, in general, um, written arrangements uh, to a certain point, but we don't have the numbers on the number of programs. Um, so, I mean, we we can look. I can go back to my our, our folks in FSA and see how many people. There's a box that you check if you have a program above a certain proportion, and we can we can pull the number of institutions. But that's all we can do. We can't look at programs or numbers. Of yeah, students. I mean, I think that would be useful just as another data point for us to understand what the. Um, what the existing need or interest is in this and how many folks are already taking advantage or that's, I didn't mean that pejoratively, taking part in the flexibilities that are already allowed within um, the existing regulatory language. Um, so I think, I think that would be useful. Okay. Um, so I, I think, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the problem you're trying to solve here is, is one where uh, there's broad public frustration that higher ed isn't providing the kind of workforce programming that it should, right? So I get that. Um, I do think that the the example of a small school that's struggling, sort of outsourcing a lot of stuff because um, it can make money on it, is real. And uh, and it also does something else for that school. It allows that school to do an end run around faculty governance processes. Um, the, so I, I wonder if it's, um, and I, and like Meredith, I'm sort of struggling whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but the, um, uh, I wonder if maybe another percentage way to look at this is not necessarily percentage of individual curriculum or individual program, but percentage of the number of programs that the institution offers. And here's why I'm saying that. I can imagine this in for particular institutions become a slippery slope real quick, right? So imagine a school, it's offering one program, not great, but um, now it can essentially buy a dozen new programs with no faculty oversight um, and resell those under its brand using uh, federal dollars. I assume that we don't want that. So, so somewhere you got to kind of do the guardrail thing. I don't know what the right number is, obviously, but um, again, a clarification, um, just to be sure that I, I can restate it. Um, but you're proposing that 
if the department were to allow a, a percentage beyond 50 percent to be offered through a, writ, uh, a written arrangement through an ineligible entity, that you would limit the number of programs at, at a given institution um, that, that were able to do that? Yes, correct. Okay. To some, some number. Some I number. have no idea yeah, what. That, that's always the hard part, but that, that, that the suggestion is taken. Thank you. Anne-Marie. So I need to step out to see one of the other committees before we end the day. And I, I just didn't want to step out in a way that looked like I, I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Um, it's, it's great conversation. And I, I really appreciate, especially as we get very specific feedback such as this, I, I, I definitely am hearing uh, Jessica and Jody and others and, and I'm hearing the concerns and I appreciate you raising them in the way that you did in a very constructive way. It's very helpful to us. I, I also, I do especially appreciate when you can come up with ideas such as that one that gives us something very concrete to, to kind of react to and say, okay, that gives us an idea that we hadn't had before. So it may not happen today. This is a very important topic and we recognize that. You hit it right on the head when you said about the idea of getting people out into the workforce. So think about it and, and kind of maybe guide that discussion in that way. It's very true that I'm really interested in achieving consensus in the full committee. And so the work that you do here is really important because your recommendations can help us to get there. And so one of the things that you're tasked with is kind of hashing out some of these details in a way that you can sit and exchange ideas. You don't have to get there today on everything. So it may be that you go back to your constituents and you come up with some new ideas together as you brainstorm. And, you know, maybe you need a little time. It's, as I can tell you, it's hard to think of everything on the fly, especially when you've been doing it for a couple of days in a row. Uh, so, I, again, I, I have to step out, but I just didn't want it to seem as if I was not interested in more of your conversation. I definitely am. And I'll certainly check in with Greg later to get more of the flavor of kind of how this went, as well as the other topics that I wasn't able to be here for. Um, but since I won't see you before you all leave, I just wanted to thank you again for your hard work and to let you know that I'll be joining you again where I can uh, for your next couple of days when you're with us and to definitely have safe travels home. Take a break, Tony. I was going to say it's 2.30ish. Uh, Did you want to take a 15 or 10-minute break? Keep, keep your tags up if you're going to comment. We can take, we do one more question. Um, Amanda wanted to say something for kind of more on the record before I left, so I just. Oh, go ahead. So sitting here, I have a lot of comments, but I'll, I'll keep it succinct to the point. Um, I think the goal that the Secretary of the Department of Education is, is making here is, as what I heard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm hearing is that they're trying to fill a skills gap. And they're trying to do this by a creative way. This was the solution that was come up forth. And I don't think that this is the solution to fill that need of, an, filling the skills gap. I think this goes deeper. This is a conversation that needs to be had at a, a not to me, a national level debate. Um, and it's very important. It is it is a true need that there is a skills gap and there's um, this isolation between higher education and what's going on in the workforce currently as it's constantly changing in our environment today and even our in our generation. Um, and I definitely think that this is a deeper issue where employers and educators, institutions, agencies, the public need to work together to provide those skills and to provide those solutions and different ideas. I think that this is a fix that may work in some other sector, but higher education is too unique and too important, and the unintended consequences are too high, especially for students. Um, the basis for this solution seems questionable, and this seems like a great business model. Um, I don't think that this is the correct lens that we should be looking for, and I'm 100% certain that without data, I don't need, I don't really think I need data. I can already probably create or try to have some predictions that if students did, if this was, if this was to happen, if this was to pass, um, and students went to a school that they were paying for something, they would come out with probably not even f fulfilling that skills gap. They may 
be really confused about what their education or their degree is actually worth. Is 25% worth for this skill, for this certification, with this degree? It's, it's not the right lens, in my opinion, like the basis of what's what the, the goal and the solution is. I don't think they connect well, especially for this space. Um, and I would highly suggest to go back to the drawing board and really ask, who are you serving? Thank you. Uh, did you want to take your break now? Do you want to? All right. So we'll take a 15-minute break, Greg. 10 of. Thank you.
Mr. Martin, you're welcome. Thank you, Tony. This was very thoughtful. Yes. This is, I think, my fourth one today, so I'm... Uh... <laughs> and you have a long car drive. I have a long car drive. My daughter is concerned that my kidneys are at risk from so much iced tea, but so far, no ill effects. So what times are your flights currently scheduled for? Oh, okay, all right. As I pointed out early, I, I, um, I'm going to put a hard stop on it for four, so. Um. Greg, did you want to pick up where we left off, or? Did you want to pick up where we left off? So, you know, with with respect to uh, what's proposed in six sixty eight five, I think we certainly knew that there would be a uh, uh, wide uh, scope of of opinion, um, and we certainly have heard uh, people's positions um, on it. And I, I think I would, um, I would broadly characterize those as uh, some, some of you are not opposed to um, providing more latitude here and the reasons for which we're doing it. Um, some of you uh, have serious misgivings about doing it at all. I, I would ask that, um, and I want to go back to, again, and, the, and we've been asked, I, I already did this, but that, at the risk of being re something redundant, um, it is certainly, uh, Irrespective of how you read the regulation, it's certainly not our intention in doing this to uh, to facilitate uh, the uh, to facilitate any abuses or facilitate a race at the bottom or some of the things that David was mentioning earlier that, that he was concerned could happen with providing more latitude uh, with this. It's, it's it's not our intent. We um, uh, the genesis for this we 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 liked the idea of the equip program and what was going on there and what what the goals of that were. Um, we don't feel that necessarily, you know, was, was broad enough to meet those goals. We're trying to find a way uh, to incorporate uh, uh, skill sets that are out there uh, with uh, uh, provided by these non-eligible entities to students enrolled in these programs. So that's really where we're, we're going. And we and I and just in talking to 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 our our uh, leadership. We have proposed 100%, and I'm just going to come out and say it. We're not wedded to that. Um, we wholly understand that there are reasons, legitimate reasons you all have for, for seeing that in a different way. But where I'd like to go at this point, as opposed to just stating, we, I think we're well aware of what our positions are. Um, if if in, in moving forward, and so that we can get beyond this, and, and, and again, we don't have to necessarily get beyond it. We're not in this, we're not. We're not at the last day of negotiated rulemaking at the head table where if there's no consensus, the whole thing is going down. That, that's not where we are with this. We're to make recommendations to that committee, so bear that in mind. So with, with it in mind that we have to make recommendations, I, I would love to hear if you are in now. Some, I'm not forcing people who are, who are feeling, no, I, don't, I, I can't abide by this at all. That, that's fine if that's your position. But for those of you who, uh, who are taking more of a, a – more of a via media with this. Where do you uh, where do you come down, and what I what ideas do you have? They don't have to be 100% um, fleshed out, but what we want to do is uh, take this take whatever you offer us back over the next couple of weeks and see if maybe we can craft an, a new language, which we're certainly amenable to doing. So, uh, with that in mind, and with 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 David and Scott capturing what we're saying, um, as you, I don't I don't mean to cut off people's comments and uh, restrict. Ideas, but I'd like to hear not just that I, I don't I don't like this or I have misgivings and these are what they are. Uh, what do you suggest that we do uh, with respect to those misgivings uh, and uh, across the board? So, my feeble mind recalls that I think Russell is next. Okay, I'll try to be brief and I'll go along with what you're what you're saying. But I, and I, I do have lots of uh, reservations about this. Uh, 
uh, from my experience in working with new programs, the thing that always seems to fall apart is the student services in terms of, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure where that all fits into assuring that you have the proper student support for accessibility and whatever other needs that are, that are out there. That's number one. Number two, I worry about uh, what is the state role in all of this. I could see something where something's not approved by the state in terms of offering <coughs> education, but suddenly it's getting federal financial aid. Uh, how does that how does that work? You know that there's some end runs that could be done there. Third and finally, the other things that it just strikes me is that what what I'd love to see the department get, and it's probably outside the scope of this, is have a real You're, like I guess why are you doing this? What are you intending to do? What when it says notwithstanding any anything in this or any other section does that mean like accreditation I just I have um, a tremendous amount of questions yeah I mean I don't know how to build on anything I said about it prior. I, it's just I think what we're trying, we're, we're moving, what we're saying here is that making it clear that our regulate nothing in our regulations prevents uh, schools from doing this, and in, in, in as far as tailoring, uh, uh, tailoring the curriculum in this in this way. So, yeah, we. Um, we don't believe so, um, but we that we think that there may have been an interpretation that it did. Um, so we, you know, we are just expressing very clearly, and and you've seen regulations and statutory language probably elsewhere that says nothing in this X, Y, or Z shall prevent, and that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just exp expressing that point clearly, as clearly as we can. But, but there are a tremendous amount of things in the regulations that prevent. And right, an institution from entering into a written agreement where an industry advisory board would set their curriculum. I'm sorry, I. The, the, well, the point that we're making here is that there, there, there may be, and in fact, there probably are requirements for accrediting agencies, require, requirements by states that may limit those kinds of things. But the department's regulations do not get into that those kinds of governance issues, um, and that's why we're explaining that here. Does anyone else at the table understand in a way that might help me? I mean, from time to time, um, institutions might say to a business partner or um, I'm just going to pick an occupation. This isn't a d defined issue. It's just an example. Um, let's say that physical therapy, like the business of physical therapy says, uh, the curriculum really needs to make some adjustments and these kinds of things because this is what we're seeing is needed in, in the practical field. And, and sometimes institutions will say, oh, well, can't do that because, you know, the federal regulations say this and the accreditor says that and the state says this. And, and I think, I think what this is trying to say is that these regulations don't prevent, you know, isn't, aren't meant to be a means of preventing uh, businesses or, or institutions from kind of having that kind of communication and, and being responsive to what a profession may need to see evolve in higher ed to be appropriate to what's happening in, in practical settings. I, I think I got that right. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But is, is that sort of what we're doing? And Okay. That's a, that's a fair description of the intent of the language. Yeah, I, I I think I'm somewhere between the two of you in the sense that, um, I mean, this is a rule of construction, so it's not actually imposing a requirement. And I know that certainly with respect to accreditation, that consultation, that institutions and accreditors do want to consult employers and should be doing that. Um, I I think the piece that makes me, every time, anytime I see governance, that makes me nervous. Um, just because our institutions are deeply committed to shared governance models and uh, 
that would be something that would be of concern um, if any if there's a suggestion that um, that the department is somehow endorsing changes to that model so but I I mean it is a rule of construction it's not a requirement although I again the the focus on on employment is a, it's sort of a more philosophical issue than that that maybe isn't appropriate for this conversation but education is about more than just jobs um, in my view Thanks. I was just, um, I appreciate uh, the comments uh, that helped uh, make this a little clearer to me, but I just wanted to ask the department, is this a problem, like what problem this was trying to solve? Um, is it, are, were you finding situations uh, like Leah was describing where a lot of schools were coming to you and saying, we want to make changes, but your regs prevent it or something like that? No, I, I don't think it's that. I, th I think that, first of all, Let's go back and, 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 and be clear that it says nothing in this section or any other section shall prohibit an institution utilizing written arrangements. So it's been done within the context of the uh, of the expansion of latitude that's proposed here with written arrangements. So I think it's just clarifying more than anything else. Uh, and remember what the, what what our stated reason for doing this was to be more responsiveness to workforce. Uh, considerations and and um, those skill sets that can be that can be provided. And I think it's just sort of um, going on record as saying that you know we, nothing in this section prohibits uh, this type of this type of thing, which we actually are encouraging uh, here. You know through through this, which would be uh, if we're if we're talking about uh, employability, we we want to encourage aligning uh, uh, the education with. What's re what's required in the workforce, and I think it's an acknowledgement of the fact that um, institutions don't always have that uh, that perspective, but that that can be provided by those entities who are actually employing students. Nerdy. I um, I like F standalone. I don't know if I like F when you combine it to the ability to outsource 100 percent of a program in a written agreement. So I. I think that becomes a bit of an issue if it's a 50% cap. Uh, you know, I, I like what it's saying, that this is not the Department of Ed's purview. There, we have our own governance processes within our universities, and we have our own, um, we prove that within our own accreditation reviews. So uh, I think like most things in this, I think once we get the wording on, if we get wording we can live with, and we don't know obviously how the main thing's going to t turn out, but on the um, on the fifty percent part, then this takes a different lens. David's saying to me, "Do you want to talk about GE?" I thought he was, "Do you want to talk about GE?" And I thought to myself, "We no, definitely don't no, want to talk don't about GE." No. Uh, so uh, overrule. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing is. Uh, so um, moving on to G, not not GE, G. Because it's the end of the day. Um, I was probably said, Dave, you have to be kidding me. No, but I didn't. Uh, so um, calculation of percentage of a program, and this this goes back to although, of course, the as proposed, the uh, regulation would allow 100 percent of the program to be offered by an ineligible entity. There still are uh, there the remember the restrictions on when it's more than 25 percent. Um, the accreditation agency in, in involvement with that. Um, so we'd still need to calculate percentages. So G uh, contains the uh, protocol for calculating percentages. And so we can just look at that when determining the percentage of a program provided by an ineligible institution or organization. The institution shall divide the number of semester, trimester, or quarter credit hours, clock hours, or the equivalent that are provided by the ineligible organization or organizations by the total number of semester, trimester, or quarter, credit hours, clock hours, or the equivalent required for completion of the program. A course is provided by an ineligible institution or organization if the contracted organization has authority over the design, administration, or instruction in the course. Um, and included but not limited to establishing the uh, requirements for successful completion of the course, delivering instruction in the course, 
or assessing student learning. So I want you to also think about this within the context of if we if we proceeded uh, in the direction of uh, less than 100 um, percent, but some other percentage, uh, this would certainly come into play there as well. Jillian? I just want to point out that we are back online, I've been told. Um, so the phrase including but not limited to, I guess I'm trying to understand, is the department's intention or what is the department's perspective on things like, and I'm thinking in a distance ed context mainly probably, but like library functions, um, academic coaching. I'm just trying to understand sort of how we're defining what makes up a program with respect to written arrangements. And I get that there's three examples here, but then it says including but not limited to. So I'm just trying to understand what not limited to means. Um, yeah, and in, in this, um, the, the probably even more important than the examples are the words design, administration, or instruction in the course. Um, we're open to suggestions about how and whether to limit that, um, but we really mean um, control over the course. So if you're just having somebody providing library resources, that's not control over the course. That's really just a resource that students can use. On the other hand, if you if you are um, contracted with a company to so that your students are essentially taught or tutored all the way through a course, um, and maybe they otherwise are just look at seeing electronic materials that that you've posted, um, that is a lot closer to assessing um, to delivering instruction in the course, uh, and and ha and that entity having control over the course. So that would be something that we'd consider to be offered by the ineligible organization or institution. Um, you know, this is like everything, a, a first attempt, um, but it is our attempt to try to identify what, what it really means to contract out um, part of your, uh, part of a program. So I think um, obviously the way it's written right now, with up to 100%, it's probably doesn't matter as much. But I think if if the intention is for the department to come back with a different percentage, then this section becomes super important because I think um, we see even now with the 25% number that different accreditors have taken different definitions of sort of what constitutes a program. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you know some people think like who's enrolling the students or who's um, providing support throughout their um, journey outside of the course. So. I think um, this language will become increasingly more important if the department's intention to move forward with even a lesser percentage mm -hmm. um, comes to light. And I would just encourage to continue to get feedback from um, accreditors and sort of academic leadership folks about sort of what makes sense in terms of how we define construction of a program. Okay. Um, we definitely are interested in, uh, in in doing that, and we also hope that you guys can provide us with um, uh, go back to your own constituencies and let us know um, if you think any of this is either incomplete or should be re restricted or whatever. We want your your feedback about this. Okay. Uh, finally, we have uh, H, non applicability to other interactions with outside entities. Written arrangements are not necessary for, and the limitations of this section do not apply to an institution's acceptance of transfer credits or the use of prior learning assessment or other non-traditional methods of providing academic credit. And I think this is pretty much stands on its face that none of this is applicable to these uh, other methods of uh, giving students academic credit, uh, uh, all of which I believe here don't would not involve uh, the institution giving the credit in that way, providing Title IV funds for those students. Because uh, if, if, if you're transferring in the credits, obviously, uh, that's allowable, but you're not, you're not paying for those transferred credits. Uh, prior learning assessments the same way. Um, sometimes uh, there are credits given for uh, life experience, same, same type of thing. Marty. Did I just hear you say the students are not paying for the credits through prior learning? No, I didn't say that. I said what I just wanted to draw a distinction between when we're talking about what actually does apply in written arrangements, you, students are being paid Title IV to take those credits at, an, at another entity, be it eligible or ineligible. What we're talking about here is non-applicability with uh, to other interactions with outside entities that this, these rules are not applicable to the institution ex acceptance of transfer credits or providing for instance, life experience credits, which you can do, but you're not looking at the student saying, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm granting you 20 credits based on life experience or 21 credits, uh, and we're going to give you this much title for aid for that. So that doesn't occur. Just trying to draw a distinction there. 
It probably wasn't a very good one, but thank you for making me clarify that. Jessica. Sure. I, you know, I think this language is written the non-traditional methods of providing academic credit is potentially very broad. If I understand your intent to just say everything in this section applies only to Title IV, it's, I understood that to be what you're saying, and I don't think I have a problem with that. I yeah, in so many words. It, in, 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 yeah, in so many words, yes. It does. It, it's more like what it doesn't apply to, and we're just making clear that it, 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 it doesn't apply to these, it, it doesn't limit or apply to in any way these other it's a totally outside thing. It's apples and oranges, and I think it's really, really what this is saying. We're not, we're not, we're not saying here. We're not limiting how a, a, an institution can uh, transfer in credit or provide credit to students based on other things. We're simply saying that um, written arrangements aren't necessary for that, and that uh, that can occur outside the scope of this section. That's all. It can occur. Does occur outside the scope of this section. Let's go to um, the next one. And uh, we're going to then uh, move on to David's discussion of uh, weak instruction. I believe that's on uh, page 14. And uh, you'll you'll notice again that we're skipping over some things in in uh, 668.2. Um, we hope to have the, a larger discussion about that when we have more time. Most of those changes relate to our proposed um, subscription period disbursement system, uh, and th that's going to be a larger discussion that is t focused on the administration of Title IV aid um, that we need to have um, probably when we have a few more hours. Um, but for here, um, 34 CFR 668.3 uh, defines an academic year um, for uh, the purposes of Title IV aid. Um, and we are modifying part uh, of one of the definitions under that, uh, un uh, under that uh, concept. Uh, an academic year for Title IV purposes has to include no less than 30 weeks of instructional time. And you can see here in the definitions, we have specific um, definitions for a week is a consecutive seven day period in case you weren't familiar with that concept. Um, we also expressed that a week of instructional time is, you know, one of those consecutive seven day periods in which one day of regularly scheduled instruction or examination occurs. Uh, so that works pretty well when you have um, a, a, a program that has scheduled instruction. If you have a scheduled course every Monday, well, it's easy to show that you have a week of instructional time. But ever since uh, the definition of distance education uh, was uh, created in the statute uh, and then in, in the regulations uh, just about um, 10 years ago, um, we there has been an explicit um, statutory provision that distance education coursework can be asynchronous and that there isn't always a case where uh, the program has structured courses that occur at specific intervals. So this, um, we add, with this addition that you see on this page is an attempt by the department to acknowledge that but provide um, a mechanism for us to, to, to count a week of instructional time uh, and, and have some framework for doing that in, an as, in a program that uses asynchronous instruction. Uh, and by, by asynchronous instruction, I mean, you know, the student goes in at times that are not specified, uses the coursework, maybe meets with the instructor at different times, all that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll read it out for, uh, for everybody. Um, a week of instructional time uh, is any week in which, uh, and there's the first concept where a scheduled instruction or examination occurs, or two, in a direct assessment program or a program offered using asynchronous coursework through distance education or correspondence, the institution makes available the instructional materials, other resources, and faculty support necessary for academic engagement and completion of the course objectives, and expects enrolled students to perform educational activities in fulfillment of program requirements. Uh, furthermore, instructional time does not include any vacation periods, homework uh, for a program offered on campus, and that's one more parenthetical addition to the third part of the uh, of the definition, or periods of orientation or counseling. And the reason for the last addition was um, it's a little harder for, to distinguish between homework and not homework when you're working in an asynchronous environment, um, and that definition does not really rely on a, on a, on a clear distinction between those two concepts. And I will pause there for questions. 
Jillian? Um, so I have like a million notes on this page and I'm still not exactly, I mean, I know what you're doing here, but I'm still not exactly sure that I feel great about it. So, um, so I'm trying to understand, we're saying that the, the, uh, with respect to Romanet two, um, these, uh, faculty support necessary for academic engagement, et cetera, um, relates to distance education or correspondence or direct assessment. I'm trying to figure out, can't you have a correspondence course that doesn't have faculty? Isn't that the whole sort of point? So I'm having a hard time understanding how these three things are sort of mushed together in one Romanet, even though um, I think I would feel better if they were not. Um, and then maybe we can have a more fulsome conversation about what a week of instructional time looks like for distance education programs and for correspondence programs. Um, and I would ask then too, I guess the rationale behind direct assessment being separated out from distance education. Um, <coughs> it feels like there's, I don't know, it's you guys, it's so late in the afternoon, I'm losing my mind. Um, but it feels like there's like some conflation happening of that all direct assessment programs have to be distance ed or they don't or why, I mean, it feels like the, the distance ed or correspondence definitions apply to direct assessment sort of irrespective. So it's not like it's a third modality necessarily. So that's confusing to me. Um, and then I would say if, you know, if there is a way to separate out distance ed and correspondence into separate Romanettes, I would suggest that the distance education one would somehow track back to a regular and substantive, which I don't think you're gonna agree with, but I'm just gonna say it anyway, because I think that it should. Um, so I just put that out there also. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, Jillian's comments about, um, I have been sort of confused by some of the different phrases for all these different types of programs um, in the sense that uh, we're now kind of fleshing out what direct assessment means. Um, but how that relates to and what are subscription based programs and I know I realize I'm jumping ahead and that we'll get to this next time but I just want to you know subscription based programs and competency based education um, things that we don't have definitions for but we are using those phrases just some feedback to take back and food for thought for next time yeah we we'll definitely take that back um, and we'll and we will have that as you said a, a more um, full discussion of subscription periods and the definition that we use and we uh, when we get to the next the next time we meet and we hope we can get some feedback about that too I'm sorry Amanda I can't see you Blackard thanks am I next Me? yeah okay. no go ahead for the for counting or trying to define what a week is for online programs um, I think it's too the definition is too weak in the sense where if I'm reading it um, it just seems like an instructor could just post items and um, the critical me missing piece is like the feedback as aspect of making sure I don't know how like I don't know if you're trying to measure I would like to see more of like trying to measure or grasp I guess that assessment piece and the feedback piece that you would get that interaction with instead of just like the interactions of the basic posting things online and that's substantial enough or as it says here um, a student also engaging in the things that are that are posted online which is a too low of a minimum if if you want to measure I, I think there needs to be more of a substantial measure for online programs I guess if you want to define it I don't have language for you I'll go back and think about it more but that's what I think is missing the most here and then the th for the third third item um, if you could just explain more like of what the thought was behind saying what it does not include I, I'm just a little can you clarify that more of like instructional time does not include vacation periods homework um, program offered on campus 
Yeah, so um, in the traditional conception of a week of instructional time, um, the only time that you could count a week is that if you had a class um, during the week. So the reason for the original language was to clearly separate just reading for class, getting ready for class, um, when you weren't actually in a class. Because if you spent a week reading um, and then you had the class the next week, well, should you really include that, that prior week as a week of instruction? Um, here, we're trying to separate the, that, that concept from the, the framework that we're creating for distance education because it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, and we're interested if you have ideas, but it's difficult for us to con conceive of a way in a distance ed world to break out the two things. So, I mean, it, if it's synchronous, you could say, you know, a class is happening on X day and then the, you're studying on at other times. But if it's asynchronous, if you're doing it in a way that's more flexible, that doesn't seem possible. So we, um, we, that, that was our attempt and we're open to feedback. I guess I would just like to see different, better words. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just feel like this isn't working. We would, we would too, if you'd be willing <laughs> to provide them. <laughs> That's a philosophy of life. We all want different and better. Um. No, I was just going to say, Amanda, I think you and Jillian are getting at the same thing. Right, right. The substance, she's talking about the substance interaction, and I think that's the same thing you're trying to get at. Yeah. It's just a matter of coming up with the words, I think, is what Jillian saw. But I just wanted to let you know that I think, yeah, I think you two are on the same page in terms of that. Russell? I think I'm struggling with a context question. Perhaps you can help with that. Give, give us, uh, you know, where are particular places where this definition would be applied and that, would, that might help us in terms of trying to get something. Sure. So, um, yeah, let's think of it this way. So let's take um, a traditional um, institution that has semesters. They've got fall and spring. Um, and that's that's when most students are taking their coursework. They define their 15-week semesters. They define their academic year as um, as 30 weeks. Uh, so it meets the minimum definition of an academic year. And that's that's so in order in order for them to um, move on to a new loan period, for example, um, the we the student is expected to complete 30 weeks. Um, so if the student com if if the school has messed up though, if they have only 20 weeks of instruction, let's say that they, they really only have 10 week terms and they have five weeks where students are on kind of a break in the middle of it. Um, in that case, uh, they're really not offering as much instruction uh, as they would have been in the 30 week example and all kinds of things happen in, in terms of the calculation of the student's aid because the department at that point says, well, you're not offering as much instruction for this 20 week of 20 week period than you would have if, if you'd met our requirement. And then in, for the Pell regulations, uh, proration calculation kicks in and they also wouldn't meet the requirements to move on to a new um, scheduled academic year for purposes of getting a new annual loan limit. So so the concept of a week of instructional time is the bedrock of counting the uh, number of weeks in which students are receiving instruction and, and determining whether aid needs to be prorated. And it also, it also is important when you're talking about programs. If, uh, if you have a program that's shorter than an academic year, then we also have numerous proration calculations where a student gets less Title IV aid. So that's the nexus for, all, for, this, for this topic. This is just a point of information. Apparently, homework does not qualify as instructional time. Um, and there's like a long standing policy that I can like send to you ab about homework. And I guess campus is also not defined as well or does not qualify. There's more, there, I can send the points of information in the statutory laws if you want for those words. Yep, if whatever you're, you you would be interested in sending, we'd be happy to look at. We can we if we can leave this for now. I know this is another one where um, people are kind of grappling with it, um, and we are very interested in your feedback. Um, 
with the understanding that this is an issue that we have to address somehow. We have to find some way of identifying a week of instructional time for these kinds of programs um, because the statute explicitly allows for asynchronous coursework. And we want something reasonable and want something that we can work with. Um, so we're looking for your help um, to get there. Uh. Russell, do you have another comment? All right. Gregory, go ahead. Uh, I just want to point out we got about 17 minutes before the hard stop. Marity. I just want to make a quick comment on this, that, that I find this helpful. Maybe we could wordsmith it a bit. I'm, I don't have as many issues with the words. But I do find it helpful as we see traditional institutions starting to come up with different term lengths and clarifying. And I, I give the example of a traditional institution now goes into online, um, starts to offer shorter terms or terms in different time frames. This language clarifies that if that online term is set to go over spring break, instruction happens over spring break. You can't, so, so I actually find it helpful, not so much for the fully non-traditional institution, because I think they get it. I think it's more helpful as traditional brick and mortar institutions start looking into some of these things. Caroline. Hi, I just wanted to request that we reserve a few minutes before our hard stop to talk about what we need to do between now and the next session and logistics. I had a couple of questions about that. Point taken. Yep. So would you like to do that about 10 of? We'll go through whatever remaining comments we have. OK. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, we had struggled with whether to um, <coughs> to introduce uh, um, some of the things from 668.8. But I think rather than do that, I probably would just get through the introduction anyway. We have to redo it again when we come back. Fine. So uh, maybe we should uh, uh, go to what we're what we should be thinking about before we uh, come back here on the 12th, right? 13th of February. 13th of February, I believe. So, no, I think it's the tw it's a Tuesday the 12th, isn't it? Tuesday the 12th. Yeah, Tuesday the 12th. Um, so we'll be back back here on the 12th. So it does give us a little bit of uh, a little bit of time, and um, hopefully winter won't be too fierce. When I'm a a big uh, inveterate hater of winter, so I'm always looking for a way to get it to the end, so I, the way I, I, I count down the number of days from January 1st through March 1st, at which point I feel that though there still could be winter, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so I play all these rhetorical games in my head with it. So by the time February 12th comes, we're just two days away from Valentine's Day, which I consider to be the last benchmark of winter. I know it's all a huge construct, but unless it helps Phil, me. Unless Phil comes out or doesn't come out. Unless Phil home. doesn't come out or comes out of his hole. We're both from Pennsylvania. Yeah, so. <laughs> so we unequivocally believe that Punxsutawney Phil predicts the weather. And if you have groundhogs in your own state, they're not the real groundhogs. I just want to point that out. There's only one Punxsutawney Phil. And Philadelphia also has the second most famous groundhog. The groundhog? Yeah. <laughs> it's the the lottery. I mean, you know, <laughs> Gus. Yeah, you. You got to give Punxy its due. I mean, you, you know, big cities there's like New York. Else in there's Punxy. nothing else in. Well, I hope no one's on here listening from Punxy. It's a fine place. For those right, of you so the one thing games, that we resolved is that Punxy Tony Phil is the best. That's correct. All right, that we can we, bring we, that we'll, to. to we'll the, take that recommendation to the committee. Right, okay. Um, so uh, between now and then, I, I would like you to uh, to think about what we've. What we've talked about here, uh, any ideas you have or uh, for language or um, if it's not language, if it's just uh, um, some indication of where you think we should go or just uh, doesn't have to be actual reg language, you can send to Scott. We'll definitely be considering that. I want to re-emphasize the fact that uh, the department, that in proposing these rules, uh, we view these as a ground. I, don't, I think um, it's been made clear to me. Uh, and I want to convey it to you from from our senior leadership that there's none of this that they're unwilling to to to, to uh, consider any changes to. So we we very much want you to come back with some 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 language that we can consider. Feel free to 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 send that to Scott in the interim. Uh, when we uh, when we reconvene, we will. Uh, go through the uh, remainder of the uh, of the topics that we've yet to discuss. I think it's going to be a little tight because remember that we're here for the 12th and 13th, I believe, and then we're required to report to the to the to the um, main committee. So how 
I, I anticipate there being a little bit of a, of, a, of a press for time between us concluding our proceedings and getting together uh, some type of report that we're that we feel comfortable with. And I don't by that I don't mean um, just one position. I mean where we are. And I have no problem with going with the report and saying, you know, there, there seemed to be a great deal of um, agreement around this. However, there was dissent over here. We don't have to reach consensus. If we did, we probably wouldn't be making any reports to anybody. So, um, and I don't think it has to be by report. I don't think we need to have a formal um, report. I'd be interested to hear what the three individuals who volunteered to go before the committee are, uh, are would be comfortable with as far as you know, the, the, the degree of formality they need uh, to, to present something to the committee. So I, I do, I think it's important that we give them something. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't have to provide something about every topic here, but mind you, if we don't, then we're leaving it entirely up to them and we have no input whatsoever. If we, if we, um, I don't want to say abrogate, that's, that's a little intense, but if we don't, um, if we don't, uh, you know, uh, Step up. That's a good word. Step up, right? It would so, be a lost opportunity. Yeah, it's a lost opportunity. Correct. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll be, I'll be thinking. David and I will be thinking about how we can uh, wrap things up early enough to get some to, to coalesce all this and get it into a report next time around. So, but, but I want to say before we, I open it up for any other ideas that I, how pleased I am with uh, uh, the way things have gone here. I know that we're so many of us are at different come to this from different positions, but I've been very impressed with the civility and um, the, the, the uh, willingness to cooperate you've all shown. Uh, that hasn't always been the case in everything I've participated in in the past, so um, I, I, I very much appreciate that. I have the utmost respect for all of you, and um, I'll be looking forward to seeing you again in, uh, in February, where I know we're going to have a huge warm spell head, and it'll, I'll be dining out al fresco, as it were. Um, so having said that, uh, Tony, you want to entertain yeah well we have Carolyn oh, I don't mean to jump in but I just had a thought or an idea um so a lot of us have maybe may some of us may be proposing language or ideas and I was wondering if maybe we should um, try to get that circulated to the group ahead of the next session so that when we come in we won't all be looking at it for the first time so maybe we should like set a date like a week before or something, and then the then Scott maybe could circulate it to the group once it's been submitted or something. Every everyone's stuff, so that people would have a chance to look at it ahead of time. And the other thing I was going to suggest is perhaps it would be helpful ti for timing purposes if there was sort of an agenda that broke it down. Like we need to get through these six things on this day. I just am a little worried that <laughs> if we spend all of our time going through the the new issues, we won't have time to look at the older issues or whatever. And maybe it would be good to sort of break it down so we can police ourselves time wise. Uh, just to add on to that, um, anything that you send to me, I will disperse to the group within uh, usually one business day, um, unless, of course, I'm at the office sick or something like that. Um, in the meantime, if you want to, as a committee, have smaller groups to discuss, get, you know, get your thoughts on papers, you don't necessarily need us to do that. You all have each other's contact information, so feel free to reach out to the people that you think will get you the best language and response you need before you send it to me. Uh, but I will expect that anything that comes to me is meant for the whole group and we'll send it out accordingly. Jillian. Yep, I have a couple questions for Greg. Marie, Gregory. Hi. I'm sorry. That's okay, I have a couple questions for you. Well, before oh. those, I just want to say that, um, and I want you to think about this because of, because of uh, something Carolyn just said. Um, would would you be, uh, you know, uh, would you be interested in coming back when you talked about an agenda, um, uh, maybe a more uh, um, a robust agenda? Uh, no, not robust, but one that holds us. Would you be interested in seeing one that maybe gave time time constraints? Like this is what we have to talk about. These are the times we think we have to meet. Would, would, are all of you kind of on that page? Or okay, all right, we can certainly we can do that. So, okay, fine, go ahead. Um, so is, um, is, are we gonna get new red lines before we meet? Because I think I thought I heard that you were gonna send those a week ahead. Right, we, we, the, I, I uh, was, I, I was, uh, I, uh, well, we would be getting red lines with us, uh, with comment, comment bubbles that will indicate some of the rationale behind the uh, regulations. Let's let me check with the person back here to make sure that. So I'm I don't saying think right so. Thing. I don't. Okay. <laughs> so. 
So, Jillian, while we're waiting on that real quickly, I'm wondering, is the expectation, because we have two more meetings, both of which we meet before so that was going to be my other committee. question, I think, so which what is, is like, what's on their agenda? What is the committee? That's, what, that's the other thing I was going to say is like, it would be helpful for this group to know um, what the full committee will be talking about in February, because I don't want to waste time writing up a report out for the full committee on things that we will meet about again before the full committee actually talks about them. So I think we need some, I think we need y'all to coordinate a bit. With the and I would say with the other subcommittees too, because they're going to be in the same boat, right? So if the full committee is only going to talk about faith issues in February, I a little bit would say I'm not even sure this group needs to report out yet because it's just going to feel like a lot of rework. Right. That that's that's a good point. W with respect to the red lines, uh, allow me to correct myself there. I think that as Scott indicated to me that the um, uh, next red lines would include. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Would include um, changes. Uh, you know what? I'll turn this over to my. I have a little bit more diplomatic way of talking than Greg. Uh, <laughs> any uh, changes in proposals between that we take back from this session or anything you send us between now and our next session, uh, we will send out with an additional new red line. Um, anything that is not changed, then you can expect that the current red line that we have is our proposal going into our next session uh, with you all. And I do think it's very important that we find out exactly what the what the um, um, main committee will take up, whether it's you know worth our. I mean, do we rush? If we're going to rush the report out, then I think we want to make certain that our report will be considered in those proceedings. If not, then there's no need for us to report until the report out to the following. I w I've been I was tentatively told we're, we we're expected to report out uh, uh, at the next in February, but I, I could definitely check on that. Yeah. So I would just respectfully recommend that you coordinate with the other subcommittees and with the full committee just in the interest of everybody's time. Especially those doing the actual reporting probably Correct. want to make certain that <laughs> what they're doing is going to be taken uh, into consideration. That's just go. Uh, did we land on everybody, Ed included or not, trying to get everything uh, sent around by Tuesday, February 5th, one week before? Yeah, I don't know that we have a date yet established, but I mean, but the time by which the point at which everything would be available to everybody, I'll let Scott entertain that. Yeah. Anything you all decide to circulate amongst yourselves, you can set a separate date for that. If I get something after the fifth, I will certainly still be sending it to you. So there's no cutoff on our end to send things to you. Thank you, Scott. Sure, and ads, red lines is just we get them when we get them. We'll take it back, but I don't make sure we'll try to get it out so that you guys have enough time to look at it again before. I, I mean, I think we need to talk with our folks about exactly how much we plan to, to do in terms of red lines. And, but, but I think it's reasonable for us to, to, to contact everybody and say and give you an indication of when you can expect that kind of stuff, uh, which we'll, we'll be glad to do. And I'm sorry, one final thing. I understand that a lot of the things that got pushed off were direct assessment and competency-based education, and I would just like to call on anyone who would like to do, like, issue papers or framing. Like, I think we haven't had a framing discussion about that, and it's something that some of us in the room are not familiar with. So to the extent you have things other than red lines that you might want to contribute, I would love to hear what you have to say. I will send you all the things. <laughs> all the things. Yeah. Russell. I wasn't expecting to talk on that, but we're working on a, a paper that I hope that we can share with you on direct assessment and CBE. So uh, we'll try to get that to you. So, so Carolyn, to your question, was was it really among us that that we make a commitment as members to each other to get stuff out by the fifth? That Is would that? definitely work. And and I think I, I take the point that if someone doesn't make that deadline, then that's okay, and we'll right. look at it whenever. But um, I think it would be helpful to if we tried to hold ourselves to that sort of general deadline so that we have time to prepare and I, I, use our time well. Great. Let's do that. So agrees. <laughs> hey, Greg, is there any final instruction about the badges or any of that? Yes, she will. I'm sorry. I, for the first, I was pretty good about that the whole proceeding. I just want to point out for the record, it's the first time I missed my mic, and it was at the very end. Yes, please leave your badges here. Uh, we'll use those again. Um, 
again, thank you for your participation. Uh, I, I wish you all a very safe trip home and uh, a great next month. And hope to see you all back in good health and good spirits again in February.